Many miles from Cromford, the southwestern extremities of the Peak District are a land of rolling hills and wooded vales. Here, as the mist rises from the valleys and the early rays of sun light the golden fields, you could imagine you had stepped into a forgotten world. This is a landscape of my birth, and also of a sadly forgotten artist, George Heath, the moorland poet. He loved this place, writing the following poem from the shores of his beloved Rudyard Lake. Glorious Rudyard, how I love to gaze on thee, ever fraught with sunny memories, ever beautiful to me. How sublimely grand the picture stretching out before my gaze, deluged with the glowing splendour of the sun's declining rays. Like a flood of molten silver, froth of gold and sapphire dipped, flashing back the efflorescence of the summer's blazing light. And away far up the valley, rising from the sunlit tide, towering hills in stately grandeur, bound the view on either side. Turning, twisting, undulating, sinking low or peaking high, throwing up a jaggy outline, quaintly cut against the sky. Rugged cliffs of mouldering sandstone break abruptly here and there, like in grown and mossed enamelled, ivy wreathed and bilberry crowned, in whose fossil bedded strata, like an ancient crypt unsealed, lies the bloom of bygone ages to the curious eye revealed, and above and all around me, stalwart trees bedeck the scene, tendril twined and ivy mantled, all enrobed in richest sheen, and the sun, in haze of beauty, sinks in solemn peace to rest, neath the bright and mystic curtain of the crimson glowing west. George Heath was born on the 9th of March 1844 and spent his life with his family in the small village of Grattan at Hallgate Farm. Now beautifully restored, life during George's time in Victorian England would have been much harder. As a young man he worked long hours on the farm, but as he grew and his experience broadened, he developed a thirst for learning and a great love of literature. He also met his true love, Jenny, who inspired much of his best poetry. In 1864, George Heath was working on the restoration of Horton Church with the great Leek architect William Sugden. Whilst undertaking the works, he was stricken with consumption. Too ill for any kind of manual labour, he took most of the days to his bed or staying around his small cottage. Whilst there, he befriended James Badnell, Reverend of Endon. He taught him much about Latin, and with his newfound thirst for knowledge and literature, George Heath began to write his own poetry, based around the landscape and his experiences in the Staffordshire Moorlands. George's closest friend of the time was also from Endon. Herbert Foster was a like-minded individual, although more highly educated than George. He went to a school in Utoxeter and had access to a fine library. Still, the young men were very like-minded, sharing a love not only of literature and poetry, but also for the landscape and wildlife of the moorlands. George had an especial passion for botany, and he would note in his diary the first appearance of each of the beautiful blooms that would line the roadsides and meadows of Grattan and Horton. An early diary entry dated February the 15th, 1869 reads, How magnificent are the snowdrops. These flowers seem to my barren and often sadly yearning spirit like my own children. Something I have a right to love and cherish. Although George had several close friends in life, as the time went on, his poetry became more melancholic, concerned with the past that had left behind him and his uncertain future. He became more and more stricken with tuberculosis. His true love, Jenny, cheated on him and then left him. And on May the 8th, 1869, in his little whitewashed stone room in the cottage, George Heath quietly passed away. All we have now are his two books of poetry, sadly out of print for over a hundred years, and the fine runic cross put up in memoriam to him 
and designed by his good friend Herbert Foster. On the base is a fragment from one of his most beautiful poems, and lying in the grave are the snowdrops which he cherished so dearly. Dead, dead amongst the winter's earth, gone where the shadows of all things go. Stretch me full length in the folding earth, wind me up in the drifting snow. No one will think of the dream days lost, of the ardours fierce that were dampened too soon, of the bud that was nipped by the morning's frost, and shriveled to dust in the sun ere noon. My life will go on to the limitless tides, leaving no trace of its current flow, like a stream that starts when the tempest rides, and is lost again in the evening's glow. The glories will gather and change as of yore, and the human currents pass panting by, the ages will gather their wrinkles more, and others will sing for a day and die. I shall want thee to dream me my dream all through, to think me the gifted, the poet still, to crown me whatever the world may do, though my songs die out upon air and hill. His beautiful words are his lasting monument. The snowdrops that inspired George Heath, those first true heralders of spring, line the woodlands and meadows of our glorious countryside, inspiring not only poets but all who look upon their delicate blooms in the knowledge that the sun is returning and the days are lengthening. Although believed for a long time to be native, the snowdrop does not appear in literature until the late 16th century, and was most probably introduced from southern Europe. Originally they were not even called snowdrops but timely flowering violets. There are many distinct subspecies and cultivars of snowdrops that can be spotted, and just a few were being illustrated now. Because of their striking appearance at the end of winter, there is much fable and lore associated with them. One Christian tale refers to an angel turning falling snowflakes into flowers to give Adam and Eve a sign of hope after their eviction from the Garden of Eden. They are now most commonly seen in churchyards, and in several locations in Britain the superstition that they are unlucky has arisen. Indeed, in some places, to bring them inside is to be seen as inviting death. Snowdrops are important to medicine also. The alkaloid galantamine was first isolated from snowdrops and is used to treat Alzheimer's disease. A much rarer but equally beautiful spring flower is the yellow star of Bethlehem, which rather than reminding one of falling snowflakes, opens up into a magnificent golden bloom, heralding the returning sun. It is very uncommon in England, and being a plant more used to Mediterranean climates, rarely flowers in this country, unless the conditions are perfect. This is Oosley Brook, just outside of the town of Ashbourne. This wooded valley harbours one of the Peak District's few colonies of this elusive plant. However, you should prepare to be unimpressed. These small leaves are all that is often visible of the plant, as it's just too cold for it to bloom. You may think it looks like any other plant, maybe even an early bluebell coming up, but it is distinguishable by its leaf tip, which coils into a small spike. Unobtrusive, to say the least. However, in the bordering county of Cheshire, near the village of Malpas, grows a location with a guaranteed sight. The golden yellow star-like flowers of the yellow star of Bethlehem appear in glorious swathes beneath this sandstone outcrop overlooking the central Cheshire Plain, where for just a few weeks in early March, its petals follow the pattern of the sun. In the evening light you could almost imagine you were in southern France, but then Cheshire has always had a very different climate to the rest of the Peak District. <laughs> 